verses 11 through 17. Acts 12, 11 through 17. I'll be reading from the New King James Version. And when Peter had come to himself, he said, Now I know for certain that the Lord has sent his angel and has delivered me from the hand of Herod and from all the expectation of the Jewish people. So when he had considered this, he came to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose surname was Mark, where many were gathered, to, where many were gathered together praying. As Peter knocked at the door of the gate, a girl named Rhoda came to answer. And when she recognized Peter's voice because of her gladness, she did not open the gate, but ran in, ran in and announced that Peter stood before the gate. But, Peter, but they said to her, You are beside yourself. Yet she kept insisting that it was so. So they said, It is his angel. Now Peter continued knocking, and when they opened the door and saw him, they were astonished. But motioning to them with his hand to keep silent, he declared, to them how the Lord had brought him out of prison. He said, Go tell these things to James and to the brethren, and he departed and went to another place. Good afternoon. It's good to see all of you here tonight, and I'm glad that you've chosen to spend your afternoon here. Uh, a couple announcements before we begin. Um, we're in need of one more teacher for VBS. Uh, and so if, if you want to teach for VBS, um, see Chris Hughes. Uh, he's the person who's arranging the teachers. Um, and uh, Monday Night Ministry. This Monday is at 6.30. Uh, it's K through 12. Uh, parents are encouraged to stay. And uh, we'll be making cards for uh, various people in the church. So. Uh, be sure to head out for that. It's a good opportunity to serve someone. Uh, so if you have your Bibles, open up to Acts chapter 12. Acts chapter 12. This is a trying time for the church. Uh, the church is going through some hard times in Acts chapter 12. Uh, James, the brother of John, uh, one of the first apostles, uh, has just been killed by King Herod. And worse than that, Peter was now uh, being imprisoned by the same person who killed James. Uh, and so I think we need to, to understand the situation. We need to take a, take a step back and examine this situation through the shoes of those people who are living in it. Uh, for them, how terrifying, how stressful, how worrisome would this situation be? Uh, you got to remember that James was one of Jesus' inner circle. James was one of the original 12 disciples. James was the person who was there through thick and thin. Uh, and he was a great leader of the early church. And here he has been killed by a king, uh, killed by a mad king. And then again, you have Peter. Peter, who's one of the greatest disciples of all time. Peter, who's perhaps the closest of Jesus' apostles. Uh, Peter, who walked on water to see Jesus. You have this, he's the man who declared that he would die for the cause of Christ. And here he is sitting in a prison cell. He's shackled, uh, shackled and chained, and he's left there awaiting his execution. Imagine how discouraged Peter must have been. He must have had all of these great plans to, to go spread the gospel, to reach people who needed to hear his message, to go places that the gospel had not gone before. But his life could be coming to a close. He was stuck in a prison cell awaiting that execution. Uh, and so open up your Bibles to Acts chapter 12. Acts chapter 12, verse 5. So Peter was kept in prison, but earnest prayer for him was being made to God by the church. And so the church who's in this rough situation, who's had the loss of one leader and could be facing the loss of a second great leader of the church, they go to God. They go to God in prayer. They're praying earnestly for Peter. Uh, I'm sure that they're praying that Peter's going to be saved, that Peter might be released uh, that uh, Peter is going to uh, be freed from this prison, be freed from his 
uh, shackles, uh, and once again work among the church. I'm sure that they're just uh, praying beyond hope that this is what happens. Um, and their prayers are answered. Uh, read with me Acts 12, verses 6 through 11. Now when Herod was about to bring him, uh, bring him out on that very night, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers bound with two chains and sentries before the door were guarding the prison. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood next to him, and a light shone in his cell. He struck Peter on the side and woke him, saying, Get up quickly. And the chains fell off his hands, and the angel said to him, Dress yourself and put on your sandals. And he did so. And he said to him, Wrap your cloak around you and follow me. And he went out and followed him. He did not know that what was being done by an angel was real, but thought that he was seeing a vision. When they passed the first, uh, the first and second guard, they came to an iron gate leading into the city. It opened for them of its own accord, and they went out and went along uh, one street, and immediately the angel came to him. When Peter came to himself, or the, the angel left him. And when Peter came to himself, he said, Now I am sure that the Lord has sent his angel and rescued me from the hands of Herod and from the Jewish people, uh, and the Jewish people were expecting. Uh, and so you have this, this amazing escape story. Uh, an angel comes to Peter in the middle of the night, the very night before Peter was to be executed, and the angel frees Peter of his shackles. And the angel tells Peter, get dressed, we're going to go. And so Peter and the angel go running through the streets of the city, uh, and the gate swings open of its own accord, and then Peter when he's just mad, realizing that this is actually happening, the angel's gone, and he's outside that city. And so that brings us to the passage that was just read. Uh, let's, let's read 11 through 17. When Peter came to himself, he said, Now I'm sure that the Lord has sent his angel and rescued me from the hands of Herod and from all that the, all, and from all that the Jewish people were expecting. When he realized this, he went to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose other name was Mark, uh, where many were gathered together praying. And when he knocked on the door of the gateway, a servant girl named Rhoda came to him. Recognizing Peter's voice, in her joy she did not open the gate, but ran and reported that Peter was standing at the gate. When they said to her, you're out of your mind, but she kept insisting that it was so, and they kept uh, saying, it's his angel. But Peter continued knocking, and when they opened, they saw him and were amazed. But motioning to them with his hand to be silent, he described to them how the Lord had brought him out of the prison. And he said, tell these things to James and the, and the brothers. Uh, then he departed and went to another place. And so after Peter's freed, he goes to the house of the church that had been praying so earnestly for him, and he knocks on the door. And a servant girl answers, and she hears Peter's voice, and she's just so happy. She's so, she realizes who Peter is, and she runs back to the, uh, to the church, and she gives the full report, and they don't believe her. It takes Peter uh, knocking on the door continuously for them to take her at her word. And so I think that there's some lessons that can be learned from this story. Uh, lessons that can be learned from the faith of this little girl named Rhoda, uh, who is not the most uh, noteworthy character in the Bible. She's not somebody who gets a lot of recognition. But I think that her story is important. I think that there's a lot that can be learned uh, from the faith of this little girl. Uh, and so the first thing that I think is important to realize is that Rhoda immediately recognized Peter for who he was. Uh, it, when Peter was knocking on that door and Rhoda an came to answer, she heard his voice. She didn't have to open the gate and see who it was, but when she heard the voice of Peter, she believed. Uh, the people of that group in that church must have been praying earnestly. They're, they must have been praying for Peter's safe return. They must have been praying that uh, everything's going to turn out okay, that uh, I'm sure they wanted nothing more than Peter to appear on their front doorstep. Uh, and there he was. And Rhoda believed. 
Rhoda believed that God could deliver, that even though uh, it seemed impossible, even though that Peter was about to be executed, God could still deliver on the prayer. And so Rhoda's immediate belief is remarkable because she was ready to accept Peter, because she was ready to accept that God could do amazing things. And I don't know if we always have that same willingness, that same readiness to accept, uh, to accept the work of God in our lives. Yeah, Peter was the answer to their prayers. Peter was uh, an apparent answer. But how often do we pray for open doors? How often do we pray for opportunities? I don't know if we always look for the opportunities that we pray for. I don't know if we always look for the doors to be open that we, look, that we pray for. Uh, and if we do look for those opportunities, if we do look for those, op- those open doors, what do we do? Do we let those opportunities pass by? Or do we take the initiative and do something about that? Well, we know what Rhoda did. When Peter appeared on their doorstep, Rhoda took advantage of that opportunity. Uh, and she, she immediately runs to the church. She runs to that congregation because she had good news to spread. She had the good news that Peter was there, that their prayers were answered, that, that Peter was saved from his execution, and he would go on to be uh, the great apostle who writes uh, scripture and who uh, was an apostle to the Jews. Um, she didn't have to wait to be told what to do. I think that's something that's commendable because she didn't wait to, uh, to be told what to do by somebody older. She took the initiative and she did what needed to be done. Um, I think it's possible that some of us have grown complacent. I think it's possible that uh, some of us have grown complacent with keeping the good news to ourselves. Uh, Rhoda had some good news, and she couldn't wait to spread it. She couldn't wait to get it out there, to tell it to the church who'd been praying so earnestly for uh, Peter's release. Um, And I think that that sense of urgency is a good thing, that that sense of immediacy is something that we need. We have good news. We've been given uh, the gospel. We've been given uh, God's word for us. And I don't know if we always have that same sense of urgency that Rhoda had. If you have your Bibles, open up to uh, Jeremiah. Jeremiah chapter 20. And verse 9. If I say I will not mention him or speak his name or speak any more in his name, there is in my heart as if it were a burning fire shut up in my bones, and I'm weary and cannot hold it in. I think that's an attitude that we should have towards Scripture. It's like a fire in our bones, and we can't just keep it in. I think too often we're content to say, well, when somebody comes to me searching for the good news, well, that's when I'll share it. But we don't have uh, a sense of urgency in spreading it ourselves. We wait for them to come to us, and we don't go to them. Um, If we have a fire in our bones like Jeremiah described, uh, then so much good will be done in the world. So much good will be done in the church. Uh, And I think the next thing that's really commendable about Rhoda is that she was persistent. And she was persistent in the face of opposition. Look at uh, verse 14 and 15 of Acts 12. Acts chapter 12, 14, 15. Recognizing Peter's voice, in her joy she did not open the gate, but ran in and reported that Peter was standing at the gate. They said to her, you're out of your mind. But she kept insisting that it was so, and kept saying, uh, and they kept saying, it's his angel. And so... There's a TV show that was on for years and years and years, Uh, and it was hosted by Art Linkletter, and later on by Bill Cosby. Uh, And this show was one of my favorites watching reruns growing up. 
Uh, but they would interview little kids, and these little kids would just say the most ridiculous things. Uh, he would ask them some leading questions, and they'd give embarrassing answers and embarrass their parents. And uh, it, it was just a really funny show. Um, but the show kind of says that uh, we can't really take seriously what little kids are saying because they're little kids. They're going to be funny. Uh, they're goofy. They do things that adults don't do. Um, and I think that must have been what the adults were thinking about Rhoda. Well, this little girl, she's just, she's just excited. Uh, we've been praying all night for Peter's return, and she's just, uh, she just imagined up Peter at the front door. Uh, and even though those people were uh, looking down what she was saying, even though they weren't taking her seriously, uh, she was insistent. She insisted that she had seen Peter, she, or heard Peter, uh, even though they rejected her words, uh, that didn't deter her from telling the truth. And I think that sometimes when opposition comes, when people oppose us, it's easy to uh, falter. It's easy to, uh, to uh, give in and just, it's easier to go with the tide. Uh, but that's not what Rhoda did, and I think that's very commendable for her. And the second group that I think some, that we need to look at in this story is the many. The people in that house, the church who is praying for Jesus. Uh, because I'm sure that they had good intentions. I'm sure that they were earnestly praying for Peter's safety. I'm sure that they were earnestly praying that he would be saved. I'm sure that they were panicked at the death of James. I'm sure they were frightened at the fate of Peter. And I believe that they wanted nothing more than to see Peter at their doorstep. But when Peter was at their doorstep, they didn't believe. They had been praying for uh, who knows how long. They'd been earnestly worried for him. Yet they weren't willing to accept Peter when he was there. I think that they had some trouble believing that God could actually deliver on the promise or deliver on their prayer. Uh, turn to James chapter 5. James chapter 5. Let's read verses 13 through 16. Is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing praise. Is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church, and let them pray over him, anointing him with, uh, with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of the faith will save the one who's sick, and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to one another, and pray for one another, that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. And that's a verse that... Uh, I'm not sure that, they, I, that I think they may have struggled with. Uh, this being a prayerful people. I think that's a verse that we struggle with as well. It's easy to uh, pray as a ra last resort. It's easy to, when things get hard, that's when you pray. Uh, but that's not how we should be living our lives. Uh, 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 through 18 is a verse... Uh, are a couple of verses that I think are key to understanding how we should pray. 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 through 18. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God, or this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Uh, and so we're supposed to pray without ceasing in all situations. If you're happy, if you're sad, uh, if you're stressed, pray without ceasing. I think it's a call to be a prayerful people, to not just be uh, given to prayer when things are hard, to not just pray when uh, things are looking down, but to pray before you get there. Pray at, in the morning, pray at night. Uh, be people of prayer. And I think that's something that, was, uh, that we can say this church was good at. They were good at praying for Peter, but I don't think that they uh, 
had faith that God could fulfill their prayers. Um, age is not always an indication of spiritual maturity. Uh, just because this house full of adults, uh, this was a house full of adults, didn't mean that they had uh, a better faith than the faith of a child like Rhoda. Just because they were older didn't mean that their faith was any stronger than uh, this child. Uh, Rhoda believed even when the ones praying for Peter didn't. And I think that should we disregard the faith of the young, if we should uh, disregard the faith of uh, children just because they're young, just because they're children, then we're making a big mistake. Everyone has different perspectives. Everyone has different uh, backgrounds. And I think that they all have merit. The church is a, is a uh, unity of different people from different backgrounds, different races, different uh, every, every aspect of life. Uh, yet they're combined for the sole purpose of uh, serving one God. And if we're discounting the faith of the young because they're young, then we're making a mistake. I don't think it's an accident that Jesus said what he said in uh, Matthew chapter 18. So if you will turn there. Matthew chapter 18. Verses 2 through 3. And calling to him a child, he put him in the midst of them, and said, Truly I say to you, unless you turn and become like children, you'll never enter the kingdom of heaven. Why does God want me to be like a, like a child? Uh, doesn't he know that I can do more as an adult? Doesn't he know that I'm more capable as an adult than I am as a child? Uh, well, I think what he's saying is that children are innocent. Uh, it doesn't take being around a child very long to realize that. Uh, they may be mischievous and get into trouble, uh, but children are ultimately innocent. Um, and they're relatively, they're relatively simple in their wants, and they're relatively simple in their needs. Uh, they aren't concerned with money. They aren't concerned with power. Uh, but what is concerning to them, what is important to them, is their relationships, is that they're loved. And I think that if we become as children, as Jesus says, uh, then being as a child will help us to understand our relationship with God. Um, God has adopted us uh, to be His children. We know that through uh, the Bible speaks a lot of adoption in Romans and Galatians and Ephesians. Uh, we know that He purchased us from sin with His blood, from the blood of His Son. And we know that He has chosen us. Uh, and so if God is our Father then we must trust that He'll care for us, that He'll take care of us, that He'll lead us where we need to go, and we need to be respectful and obedient to Him as children would be towards their Father. And so, in conclusion, I think that there's a lot to be learned from this little servant girl, uh, from a girl named Rhoda who had faith when other people didn't. Um, if we have faith like Rhoda, then... Uh, I think that the sky's the limit towards what the church can be able to do. Um, we need to pray as that church prayed, but we need to have faith that God can fulfill those prayers. Uh, and so if you know what you need to do to be saved, uh, if you want to put on Christ in baptism, or if you need the prayers of the church, uh, then come forward as we sing.